Hi right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In preparation for our Clone Wars history series, we continue covering the events that led up to the Clone Wars. So far, we've looked at several key events that led to the conflict and how the Clone Trooper program was first started. Today, we'll be looking at how the first clones were created and altered, and the beginnings of the Special Forces program. Now, the canon version of how the Clone Trooper program started is relatively scant in detail. It goes like this. Count Deegu is tasked with finding a genetic template, he hires Jango Fett, and the Kaminoans alter the DNA of the bounty hunter in order to create the ideal soldier. The problem with this relatively short description is that it skims over a lot of very important details that helps us truly understand what life was like for the clone troopers and what kind of organization they actually were. If you really think about it, the clones were actually slave soldiers. They were the property of the Kaminoans contracted to the Republic to fight their wars. They had no rights, no freedom, no property. Their one purpose in life was to fight and die. For a trilogy supposedly targeted towards children, this is an extremely dark piece of information that is oftentimes left out for obvious reasons. And the fact that the Republic and even the Jedi openly embrace these soldiers' new role in the Republic says a lot about the values of these organizations. The Republic technically had anti-slavery laws and strict regulation on the type of cloning that could be conducted within its territory. And by all accounts, having a clone army was completely against a lot of these regulations and laws. The Jedi, with all their self-righteousness and talk about protecting and respecting life, should have had some reservations about commanding the clones. And perhaps in times of peace, they would have. But we are to be judged by our actions not only during the best of times, but also at the worst of times. This, for me, was always a major disconnect. How could the Republic and the Jedi claim to be morally superior and the so-called good guys of the franchise when they were using, essentially, a slave army? It's something that the George Lucas films and cartoons don't really cover. I mean, we do momentarily see small pieces of this truth occasionally surface and shatter this false facade of a glorious clone army. There was the episode where the clone trooper Slick betrayed his brothers for some monetary gain. It's the Jedi who keep my brothers enslaved. We do your bidding. We serve at your whim. I just want something more. Or the episode where we see Cut Quain, the clone that got away and started a family. I was just another expendable clone waiting for my turn to be slaughtered in a war that made no sense to me. But these brief moments of clarity and truth are oftentimes brushed aside quickly by more gung-ho clones, happily following their Jedi generals into certain, and most of the time, unnecessary death. And now that we're in the Disney era, we continue to see the same. Not once do we hear Captain Rex and Rebels lambast about the horrible situation he was put in the day he was born. Instead, he reminisces about the old days and is almost nostalgic about the Clone Wars, as if the fact that he was a slave didn't bother him even one bit. This does say a lot about the character of these individuals. Words like selfless, heroic, and stoic pop up, but in reality, it's also quite sad. What if I am choosing the life I want? What if I'm staying in the army because it's meaningful to me? And how is it meaningful? Because I'm part of the most pivotal moment in the history of the Republic. If we fail, then our children and their children could be forced to live under an evil I can't well imagine. A fine individual like Rex in another life, another galaxy, would have had a family and probably been quite successful pursuing whatever endeavor he was interested in. Now, like a lot of Star Wars fans, I fell for the pro-Republic propaganda and failed to understand just exactly what these clones were going through. But there is one piece of Legends lore that does go into detail about what happened to the clones and what life was like on that godless water world full of walking dolphin mad scientists. It's a story that will make you understand just how evil and terrible the clone trooper program actually was. So after Count Dooku reconnected with Jango Fett and offered him the job to basically be the template for the entire clone army. What makes you think I'd be interested? A chance at immortality to pass on your ways to an army crafted in your image. A great deal of money. How could a man such as you not be interested? Jango Fett also accepted the role of training the special forces section for that clone army. In order to do this, Fett enlisted the help of 100 men and women, mercenaries, bounty hunters, and soldiers who were the best at what they did and were mostly Mandalorians. They would be known as the Kul Voldar, which is Mandoa for those who no longer exist. I apologize, by the way, for my terrible Mandoa pronunciation. I did work in a Mandalorian taco joint a while back as a dishwasher, but all I really learned was curse words. 
so yeah. Anyway, each member of the Kul Valdar had different specializations. Some were trained doctors, surgeons, and combat medics. Others were specialists in counterinsurgency or foreign internal defense. Each one of the Kul Valdar were given 104 clones to train into clone commando companies. One of the trainers was a Mandalorian by the name of Cal Skirda, and much of what we know about the early days of the Clone Trooper program comes from his first-hand accounts and the accounts of the clones under his command in the Republic Commando series by Karen Travis. This is one of my favorite Star Wars novel series. I do highly recommend it. You see, the clone troopers we see on the battlefield weren't the first generation of soldiers to be cloned from the FET DNA. There were many, many failed attempts before something was deemed usable by the Kaminoans. We talked about the Kaminoans in some detail in our last two episodes and what their culture was like, but basically they had sacrificed a good percentage of their own population through genetic cleansing in order to survive a catastrophic natural disaster that turned their world into a water world. The Kaminoans were cold and calculating and they saw the clones as a product and nothing more. This meant that many of the earlier clones were simply just wiped out for the smallest of the problems. One entire batch of clones whose eyesight was in 2020 disappeared mysteriously. Most clones who were basically just children at the time were terrified by the Kaminoan cloners for this reason. If an individual showed any kind of genetic defect or any kind of behavioral problems, they could risk being exterminated. Now, the Kaminoans had determined that Jango Fett was far too individualistic to make a good soldier, so one of the first things they attempted to change in the clones was decreasing their independence while at the same time increasing their loyalty and discipline. They also increased their stamina and lung capacity and decreased their reaction times and removed some flaws Jango Fett had, like some basic allergies and a slight astigmatism. The Kaminoans had considered making the clones sterile in order to protect their product just so that other companies can uh, breed them and steal their technology. But in the end, it was determined based on prior projects, sterility oftentimes led to more unstable clones. There were also more extreme genetic experiments like Clone Force 99. These clones exhibited almost superhuman traits, making them extremely deadly and also unstable. These clones were most likely preserved when the Jedi stepped in and took a larger role in monitoring the clone training program. It's also why clones like 99 probably are still alive, because if the Kaminoans had it their way, they probably would have killed him, put him inside of a blender, made him into protein paste, and then fed it to his fellow brothers. The Kaminoans are basically the worst alien species in the galaxy. One of the first batch of clones was known as the Null Class Advanced Recon Clones. There were 12 of them in all, and only 6 of them survived the extreme alterations to the Jango Fett DNA. These known class clones were larger, faster, stronger, and more aggressive, but ultimately deemed uncontrollable by the Kaminoans. They were simply too independent and exhibited extreme dislike for authority. Scheduled to be decommissioned, Kaus Skirda, one of the Kul Voldar, saw the Nulls for what they were, children, and with Django Fett support, saved them and trained them for special Black Ops missions. They would go on to serve with distinction and were probably some of the best clone soldiers ever created. They would also be known as Kaus Skirda's private army because they basically wouldn't listen to anyone else and existed outside of the traditional command chain. Most of their operations were deniable by the Republic and the Republic just basically looked the other way because they were so effective at what they did. Another batch was created after the Nulls, known as the Alpha Class Advanced Recon Clones. This group of 100 was directly trained by Jango Fett himself. These arcs were quite similar to the Nulls, but more obedient. While the Nulls were more or less independent operators, the Alpha Class arcs were capable of functioning inside of a traditional military structure. The Alpha arcs would go on to later train the arc troopers we see in the Clone Wars cartoons. Those arc troopers, like Captain Rex, were quite skilled, but were nowhere near as deadly as the original Alphas because they lacked their genetic mind modifications. The Kaminoans had created the Alpha Class clones as a concession to Jango Fett. Their own version of Special Forces would be the more common clone commandos. The commandos were even more loyal and less independent than the Alpha Class arcs, but in general were still more creative and effective and aggressive than your average clones. They were born and trained in four-man squads that were part of commando companies trained by Jango Fett's Krul Valdar. Each commando company's personality and culture was greatly affected by their trainers. Some trainers like Kaus Skirata considered each one of the commandos as his own son and taught them how to speak Mandalorian and raise them with Mandalorian values and culture. Combat records actually show that clone commando units that were given a Mandalorian identity usually performed better and had a higher survival rating than the units that weren't trained by Mandalorians. The commandos, while less capable when compared to individual alphas or nulls, 
were still quite deadly as a well-balanced team and units, and even able to take out Jedi, as some were used in Order 66 to hunt down remaining survivors. So guys, there you have it. That is our intro to the clone training program. I think it's really important we talk about what's covered in the Republic Commando series because it kind of shows us just how terrible the Kaminoans were, something that the Clone Wars cartoons and the movies don't really tell us. It's also interesting to go through the various uh, different types of special forces because we're probably going to have to talk about them later on. So guys, don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below and that notification button as well because we are going to begin the Clone Wars history series very soon. I've already begun writing the episodes. Anyway, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.